Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Buzz Travel Expo and our keynote speaker panel discussion today on the future of travel. If you work in travel for any amount of time, you will know the meaning of the word crisis. Travel resilience, as it's always been in the past, is undergoing its most urgent crisis yet. From the precedent of what we may have all faced in the past few decades, the unforeseen toll of the ever-present COVID-19 virus has proven to be unprecedented and unrelentless. But where have we come from? We've come from motor coach tours to the FIT customer. We adapted. We had the dawn of the internet and with it, online travel agents and the more traditional tour operator not only adapted, but now we see an industry that combines the, these two entities in two ways that we could never imagine back in the late 80s. When the airlines stopped paying commissions, travel agents got creative while keeping customers satisfied and assured. We've had wars, the Gulf War, Afghanistan, uprisings, Arab Springs, strikes, protests, and we've had terrorism with 9-11 and so many acts of ter terrorism committed all over the world resulting in the loss of innocent lives. For those of us who work in travel, we've been creative, innovative, and dynamic. We've learned to take these experiences and changes and pivoted to present the best of our industry, the best that we have to offer. The tur tourism has adapted. Um, there's just so many things that, and so many unique situations that have forced many players on the field to strike out and leave the game, but yet tourism has adapted and has persevered. We are the most self-assured industry in the world because we have faced these many unique situations. We've always believed in travel and in everyone's right to travel, and we will always do that. Today, rather than dwelling on the problem, we're once again searching for solutions. That's what we do. We work in travel. We're looking to our industry leaders to answer some questions or maybe even not answer these questions, but create new questions. We're looking at our destination management organizations for advice, for leadership. And with that in mind, I invite you over the next hour or so to listen to these industry experts as we take apart what will be the future of travel. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our moderator, that is Stephen Ekstrom. He is the founder and president at Relate Strategy Group. Stephen? Wonderful. Thank you, Rose. It's nice to see your face. Uh, and nice see to so see many you familiar too. faces. <laughs> uh, so many faces here that I've, I've known for going on 15, 20 years. So it's great to be participating in this. Uh, I'm gonna start our panel discussion off with a single question for each of the panelists and I'll call you by name. And that is what word would you say best describes the future of working in travel? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with you, Jared. Sure. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, Buzz Travel. So I thought about this quite a bit and you know, I, I think, as Rose just said, we've been through so much in the last three, four months has felt like an eternity to a lot of us. And I think that the next six to 12 months will probably feel much of the same. So dynamic is the word that I chose and dynamic in that uh, there's going to be a lot of change and some of that change might not be for the better. It might be still negative. It might be bumpy, but also dynamic in that the word sort of connotes new ideas, innovation. And we've already seen that. And we're going to see more of that. I was on, um, I was on a call yesterday with uh, a CEO of a, a day tour company in New York. And they had raised quite a bit of money just before the pandemic and they were ready to roll. And then everything came to an abrupt halt. So she comes from a software background, her and her team. In the past three months, four months, they have completely made a 180 pivot and they have created a CRM meets Google Doc software package to sell into 
our industry, the trade. And, you know, literally in a few months, they were able to get this product live. And I just, in having different conversations with startups in the tech industry and in travel with operators, these pivots are just becoming more and more apparent and it's happening faster and faster. So I think the dynamic nature of this industry will continue to grow. And I think in the end, it will make us a stronger industry for it. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, Greg, you're up next. Great, thank you, Stephen. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today. And uh, the word I chose was collaboration. Um, I think it's gonna be absolutely necessary for our industry to come together um, and when I speak to that, I, I'm saying really all sectors. We're talking about the private sector and the public sector and the civil sector all coming together because, you know, as, as Rose had referenced, there have been, you know, a number of events that the industry has tackled. And I, I think that there has been collaboration in the past, but what, you know, some of those examples um, bring forth is that, for instance, when commissions were taken away, as you mentioned, uh, the travel advisor community got creative. Um, but typically a lot of the, you know, the reaction or uh, the solution comes from one particular part of the part of the industry, one particular sector. Um, and everybody kind of addresses it in, within their silo. But as we know, this pandemic um, has affected the industry at large. So it is gonna really require everyone's collaboration. And, you know, to that end, even, Tourism Cares, a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, we recently uh, collaborated with five other NGOs uh, to come together uh, as a coalition, the Future of Travel Coalition, uh, where you know, we know that we will do better together. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've admired a number of these entities from, from afar, and uh, we're looking forward to working with them together. So I think uh, collaboration is the key. Great, I appreciate that. Somebody needs to answer the phone. Um, <laughs> Jed, you're up next. What one word do you think describes the future of work in this industry? Uh, thanks a million, Stephen. I suppose, um, and the epitome of this word, I, I would say creative, but I'm also gonna, I'm also gonna use a second word as well because I'm a rule breaker and that's how I roll. Uh, creative and flexible uh, is, is what I would say. I think, um, you know, you, you sort of um, outlined earlier on, Rose, the, um, the, the various crises which we as an industry have um, endured over the past, you know, 10, 20 years and actually forever. And we've, we've shown incredible resilience as we've bounced back from all of those. This one's a little bit different in that it's affected both the supply and the demand side of things. Um, and it's done it obviously on a global scale. So, you know, for me, we're going to have to get incredibly creative um, about working our way out of this particular crisis. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the one of the, the ways which we're, we're starting to see on, on our side now is you've got a whole load of destinations in the Mediterranean region and the hotels and everything else. And they're having that realization now that their you know, their key months, their key summer months um, are going to be decimated. So they're having to get creative now and start to, you know, extend their season where they can, and they're trying to promote themselves in that way. Um, and, and that's just one example of the kinds of creativity that we're going to have to see. Um, and I think we're going to, you know, we're going to have to see that in other ways as well with regards to, um, to really the customer experience. You know, we, we talk about all of the borders opening up and in the UK today on the BBC, we saw that, um, there's a whole load of borders which have opened up for the UK holidaymakers to travel to some 75 countries. Uh, the great unknown is what's the holiday experience? What's the travel experience going to be like when you get there? Um, and we don't know yet. And I think there's going to need to be creativity on how we communicate what that experience will be. Great. I appreciate that. Uh, next up, Jonathan. Hey. Hi, everyone. Jonathan with uh, HTTA.us. Um, I'm also going to break the rules. I'm going to invent a word, which is decompromising. Uh, it's usually, it's really a composed word. Um, it, it actually goes very much in tune with what Greg and Jed were saying. To a certain extent, like tourism uh, needs to be adaptable, flexible. Uh, there's going to need to be a lot of collaboration. Um, but we are actually going to have to do things better the next time around, which means that we cannot 
make the future of travel and working in travel dependent on what the market dictates. We have to control the narrative and what we do. It can be from low seasonality traveling to sustainable you know, travel to breaking uh, typical rules of hospitality management or aviation management like revenue management, which eventually never takes into consideration in the supply chain risks and risk management and business continuity, knowing that our industry, as glamorous as it may look, happens to be extremely prone to disaster and catastrophe consequences. Um, so I'm going to stick with my decompromising, even though I could have picked something a little easier or simpler. Great. And Catherine? Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Catherine Prather here with the National Tour Association. I'm going to use uh, a word that I have been saying a lot over the past several months, and we've actually heard it a, a couple of times already, and that's pivot. Um, for those of you who are fans of the, the U.S. sitcom Friends, if you need a little comic relief, um, I suggest that you um, uh, Google for the, the YouTube, uh, YouTube video of the couch that Ross bought. And as they were trying to maneuver it up the stairs, every time they needed to get around an obstacle or a corner, he would yell, pivot. And I feel like we have been doing that a lot. We will be in a constant state of reevaluating. And, you know, not only are we sizing up things for safety, but, you know, right now we're also having to look, um, take a new look at history, society, and our environment and reevaluating travel's role in understanding and advancing these realms and then pivoting in terms of uh, what skill sets and knowledge base is needed and, and who is needed. So uh, I'm, I'm going with pivot. That's a good one. And I have a couch to move later on if you're not busy. Um, <laughs> Rose, a single word that you, you think might describe the future of work in the industry? Uh, I didn't quite hear that. A critical word or a cynical a word? A single word that you think might a describe word. the future of work and travel. <laughs> well, um, I'm in my, I know that in my introduction, I talked a lot about adapting and being able to adapt. And I guess the new word for that or the new catchphrase for that is to pivot. Um, it's a lot harder than you think. I think, um, you know, when I talk to a lot of my clients, um, they are, it's hard for them to embrace that a new idea or to go into a new direction. Um, and, you know, our job is, I guess, you know, at Roseworks is to, is to be very convincing um, that this is, you know, the, the, the most critical thing that they can do and that they must do it now. So, um, what they are often surprised about is that after um, they turn away from what was comfortable, what was reliable, um, and embrace something new, uh, they realize that they can adapt and they're empowered. And this is such an important thing because, you know, as we deal with, with all of these challenges, we need as suppliers as well as uh, consumers and tour companies, we need to feel empowered. That's how we need to go forward with what's going on today. So if we can do that, if we can change the way we think and you know, release ourselves from previous modes of thinking, you know, my business is only going to do well if I do this oh, I'm never going to go after that market because it's never given me any key results. Uh, we have to really stop thinking about that in those terms and going forward saying, why don't we try this? Not because we have nothing to lose, but because we have everything to gain. That's a great point. Uh, for the next section of the discussion, there'll be a question directed to each of our panelists. For those of you who are joining and participants, I encourage you to use the Q&A button on your screen. If you have questions that you'd like to bring to the panel, by all means, feel free to drop them in there. Our panelists will be able to respond to you directly uh, through that chat screen, or you may be called upon or your question may be brought up later on in the conversation. Uh, so Jared, uh, joining us from Wildebeest Marketing Agency, 
based on your marketing experience with tour and activity operators and the destinations they visit, how do you see the balance between in-house labor and outsourced services? How do you see that evolving? Sure. So, you know, my experience is multifaceted in that I started as on the agency side, went in-house um, in travel, left travel for a short time, missed it too much, came back and went back agency side focused on this industry. So I've kind of seen things from all different angles. Um, so I say that only because it's easy for me to get up here and say, well, yes, of course, everyone should have, have an agency and outsourced services will continue to play an outsized role as companies think about their, their, their future. But I think it's really true. I think the travel industry um, needs specialists. And when it comes to marketing services, they need specialists in areas where they just don't, they don't have them. And I've, I've seen this again from the inside out where a lot of marketing teams, whether it's at an operator, a destination, a technology company, they're built around generalists. And I think that's great. And that enables a company to be fairly nimble and try out a bunch of different marketing channels to understand what fits. Once you, once you actually prove a channel, then it becomes important to get more specialist inputs, whether it's around things like SEO, which is one of our specialties at Wildebeest or content marketing that there is in-house expertise at some large, some of the larger companies, but I'd say more times than not, there, there, there isn't. So I think as teams start to think about what the future holds and the fact that there's unfortunately been so many layoffs, but at one point the work will return, it's gonna be this constant battle of, okay, we know we have deadlines to hit. We know we have budgets to spend. We know we need to be out there and communicating to our clients. Now is not the time to stop that. Yet we're working on half the amount of full-time employees as we were four months ago, what do we do? And I think that's where the, the power um, and the value of an agency really comes in. One last point is I think, you know, the, the budget pressures that everyone is under um, at brands and suppliers right now, I mean, that's real and that will continue. And, you know, we're not naive at, at, at Wildebeest. We know that marketing is usually the first thing to go, but at some point it will come back. And actually a lot of our clients have been spending, believe it or not, during this time with us in order to prepare them for what comes next. And I just think as the budget pressures continue, having someone as an agency on a project basis actually makes more financial sense than quickly starting to hire full-time employees back. Of course, that will differ for everyone. I appreciate that. Um, Greg, Tourism Cares has been doing some great work for almost 20 years now. And giving back to the people and places our industry depends on has been a guiding principle of Tourism Cares. What do you think the best outcome for the tourism industry and, and organizations like yours would be going forward? Stephen, if I may, I, I just kind of want to, um, I don't want to say take issue, but address the word outcome, because I think it's already been referenced here that um, we're going to have to go through a series of pivots. So I think the minute that we start to focus in on one outcome, it's going to be time to pivot to a, a next outcome. Um, so it's important when we're kind of, when I'm answering that question to address the fact that the best outcome is an evolution and it's a learning. Um, it's a journey that we're all on. And it's really important, um, especially today to be focusing in on sustainability. Jonathan already referenced it. Um, I think the best outcome in the eyes of Tourism Cares is that sustainability become a word that not be deemed a trend. Uh, I think that so many people see it as something that's ancillary, but it's, it's absolutely essential. And it's really important for people to understand. And I think one thing that the pandemic has done is it's created this better understanding of how fragile our entire ecosystem is and how necessary tenants of sustainability are. Um, and I think especially, you know, in this day and age with the pandemic, we're talking about how really the health of destinations is so critical to the overall health of the, the industry. So I'm, I'm looking for, in terms of a best outcome, progress and evolution, and, and Tourism Cares is, is there to help uh, everyone on its journey. 
Fantastic. Uh, Jed joining us from Low Season Traveler. Roughly 70% of all travelers visit during the peak season in a destination, which obviously contributes to the demand for seasonal and part-time labor. What changes do you envision for both the peak and the off-peak travel? And what impact do you think that'll have on the workforce? I think, uh, you know, really, I, I do think we're going to see a change um, and quite a welcome change in in the flattening of the seasonality curve. We're all getting used to the flattening of the curve. Uh, so we, we may as well keep on that theme, a different kind of curve. Um, but, you know, look, seasonality is something which has affected our industry for for years, you know, in, in, in here in Europe. Uh, you have many destinations that you know they, they do all of their business in five months of the year in the summer um, and then there's nothing and they shut down um, and the work is finished um, and I think you know they're already th there are signs that they're starting to realize that actually you know they have they have more in those destinations that is available year round they've never had the confidence to to really sell it um, and to promote it um, so you know if you if you take a destination like um, like Rome or Athens they still have peak seasons, which are in the summer, uh, which is obviously it's when the, the, the weather is finer. Um, but, you know, that's not the, re the reason that people go to Rome and Athens. It, it's actually it's not for the weather. It's for the it's for the history. It's for the culture. And all of that stuff is there in, in January, um, but it's there at a lower price. So I think destinations are starting to realize that they need to flatten out um, and broaden that seasonality, which will mean that there will be work all year round. It's a tremendous opportunity for the industry. Um, but I think. One of my fears, you know, we, we're talking a lot um, and there's been some great comments made about the pivot word. Um, and I love that Friends episode, by the way, Catherine. Um, in order to pivot, you have to first of all realize that you absolutely need to pivot. Um, and, you know, I guess a lot of our viewers will be familiar with it. The curve of change, whether a seven you get, and it's only once you get to acceptance that then you can start to be innovative and creative and realize what you need to do. And what I'm seeing in Europe is an awful lot of destinations and properties are still on denial, which is frightening considering that we're three, four months into this thing. And they're saying, no, no, we're gonna have a summer season. And you can see the, the data and the stats on this, and they are not gonna get that summer season. It's gonna be about 20% of what it was. Um, so that I think as an industry, we, we need to actually kind of move through that curve of change a little bit quicker. And then be ready for the opportunity. You know, if we can crack the seasonality curve, and if we can, you know, be proud of our destinations all year round, it's a more sustainable form of tourism for everybody. But it means that we can also welcome more tourists because we can welcome them throughout the whole year. Uh, so big opportunities, actually, I, I believe. You make some really great points there, um, Jonathan. Uh, HTTA is the organization that you're working with, and. The question that I have for you is, what are some common misconceptions that people have about work in the tourism industry as it has been and, and what you see going forward? And how can we combat those misconceptions and, and stay connected more effectively? Sure, so th there's a few things. I mean, first of all, for anyone who works in tourism or travel, it's not a mystery how fragmented uh, we are because uh, I think it's Greg who mentioned silos uh, very early on in the conversation. Um, somehow, like we don't look at travel as a sector we belong to. We look at the niche that we belong to. Could be, uh, you know, hospitality, could be activities, could be uh, tourism, uh, airlines, you name it. Um, but um, right now, when you see what's going on as far as the job market and people that, <laughs> used to work in tourism because unfortunately, especially in the US, uh, a lot of people, especially in hospitality have been impacted. Um, there are a couple of uh, misconceptions. First that, you know, uh, that there are no opportunities for uh, transfer of skills or uh, actually something that's called reallocation of labor. Um, there are lots of opportunities that are coming, uh, but they're not gonna happen anytime like like too fast. Um, reallocation is really, I think, where uh, we will see our salvation uh, when it comes to uh, the workforce um, being able to be vibrant again 
Um, and reallocation uh, typically doesn't work based on studies that have been conducted over crisis of the last 30 years when you're trying to basically cross industries. Uh, 13 to 14 percent of people who took today or yet, yet until the crisis hit were working in travel might actually migrate to a completely different industry. But realistically speaking, people will uh, that have dedicated time to energy and have built their experience uh, in travel in one of the different vectors of travel uh, will probably remain in it. So the question becomes more, what do they need to do? What do they need to look at in order to pivot, uh, either change their career or um, uh, find a new trend and get back on their feet a little faster and without thinking of the state or the country they live in as uh, the purveyor of their livelihood. Um, so typically um, reallocation is a very important part. And I, I invite everyone who's today uh, either furloughed or unemployed to actually uh, pay very close attention to what are the conjoint uh, pieces of travel that apply to them too, right? If you're, you know, if you were a GM in a hotel uh, that had to close, um, you, you have to look at the opportunity that exists, you know, with activities and attractions that exists with food and beverage, even though it's considered healthcare, even with um, retiring homes that actually now are booming as far as recruitment is concerned. Um, you have to look past, you have to get rid of uh, any sort of limitations or um, blindness uh, that exists typically in our industry because we're so fragmented. Very difficult to start looking uh, at a macroscopic that travel is a massive sector with opportunities that will arise at different rhythms and that there will be opportunities for a lot of people currently looking for, for, for a job uh, or for pivots, uh, like as to where they can seek those opportunities. Um, the other myth that exists, but I'm not gonna be speaking too much about it here is furlough. Uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, have been stuck in a, in a status that wasn't being used to that extent or that degree in the past. And that was meant by a lot of businesses when they put their employees in furlough as a good thing. Uh, but it has created a massive mental block with a lot of people when it comes to actually uh, focusing their attention on updating their resume, updating their skills, looking for opportunities, even if there are gap or bridge opportunities uh, until basically our industry is healthy again. Uh, so uh, the one thing I want to encourage anyone out there watching this that might happen to be in, uh, you know, in a furloughed status is to basically act as if basically you're not getting this call back. Simple as that. Uh, get yourself in the survival mindset already. Uh, like, because you cannot uh, expect from anyone at this time definitive answers, including the employers that you believed in who potentially put you in a furlough status, <laughs> hoping to get you back. Well, I appreciate that, Jonathan. And I think that piggybacks on what Jed was pointing out in that these a lot of organizations that are expecting that big summer push are doing so like everything is normal because they've they've experienced slow seasons before, but this time it's different. Um, and with that, Catherine, uh, with your organization NTA and, and other associations, they've always played an important role in helping businesses and the individuals that work for them uh, build and maintain their own relationships within the industry. What challenges do you hear your members are facing? And what specifically are organizations like NTA doing to help their own constituents? Thank you. For frame of reference, if you're not familiar with NTA, even though we have national and tour in our name, we do have members in more than 40 countries and our tour companies, they do package travel for groups of all sizes and people all ages, but they also um, do independent and private tours, just to give you a frame of reference for what I'm talking about. And our members do include restaurants, attractions, experience providers, and, and destinations as well. Um, but you know, with NTA in terms of employment and the workforce, 
our members are facing huge losses of talent and institutional knowledge. You know, every week we're hearing um, or we're learning of, of more colleagues who are laid off or as, as Jonathan referenced or, or furlough, uh, furloughed. Uh, you know, the companies are, they're losing talent and they're losing the person who have that connection, that direct connection with the clients and then with their associations where they do uh, a great deal of, of business. And then when you take it down to the personal level, our displaced colleagues, they're losing important opportunities for personal growth and for expanding their personal tribe of, of friends and partners. Um, they're also losing the rewards from uh, growing the company's business, which is enriching for their own self-esteem. So our, our members will face massive need for training and retraining employees now taking on multiple roles. And, uh, you know, in many cases, so many people are working remotely. And while this is, you know, I'm, I'm in my home office and while this is necessary at this time, it does create its own unique uh, set of challenges. Uh, and, you know, part of that is we need to maintain in-person connectivity. You know, this is, this is fantastic, but we're humans. We need that in-person connectivity. I feel for the best possible collaboration and creative productivity and that's tough with these remote situations. You know, we need our best people at their best because there's still so much to figure out. You know, for example, just think about the very things that will curb the spread of the virus and keep us safe wearing masks and physical distancing don't necessarily align with good travel experiences. So how do we make this work? So those are some of the things that our, our members are, are grappling with. And, from day one, just speaking about NTA specifically, we have been talking to our members, hearing their needs, and then doing our best to address what we've heard, which is advocating for small business relief and then helping them navigate that small business relief, providing access to experts who can help them with questions about insurance, legal issues, and health and safety. And what, what I think has really been most important is facilitating conversations because more than anything, they want to hear from, from one another. For the individual contacts at our member companies, they sometimes just need someone to listen. Many on our NTA team, our, our staff, they've been around for a long time. Like I've been with NTA for more than 26 years. So we have a relationship with our member contacts. So the same is true for those we've lost. We want to connect with them. So, you know, very quickly, it was great to have a conversation with Jonathan and learn about HTTA, which we endorse, because we want to maintain a connection with the good people in our industry. Um, you know, we're offering a discounted rate through HTTA to our certified, to, uh, certified tour professional program because we think it's the right thing to do and it's important for training. And we did that for our members as well. Um, we're offering a special registration fee to our displaced colleagues to VTREX, which is our virtual conference that we'll do in November. And this individual non-member rate is something we've never done before. And we're even looking at a new membership category for individuals. So it would be a, a place for these displaced colleagues. Um, and, and then also we need to help our members navigate uh, the legalities and labor laws related to working with contractors and, and having part-time employees, because we know uh, there's gonna be a lot more of that in the future. Great, uh, I appreciate that insight. And Rose, uh, what are some of the most critical changes that individuals who are working in the industry must make to face the future effectively? I think, well, that's, that's a very good question because I'm faced with that myself as many of my colleagues and partners. And so we've been um, discussing this a lot lately, like what, what would that, what does the future look like for us specifically? Um, and I think, you know, one of the most important things that we keep saying to ourselves is that um, tourism always comes back. It just kind of morphs into something else. And then we have to go and learn that something else. 
Um, so right now, as I as I do, you know, the bit of work that I have, one of the things, and I can't encourage this enough, is that I've been educating uh, during this time. And we're, you know, when we're doing our thing and we're going to our trade shows and we're seeing our friends and colleagues, we're just too busy. We're too busy sometimes to learn something, to learn how to do something new within our industry, uh, connect with a different branch of our industry. Uh, so recently I've been doing a lot of education on the side of the mice market, which has always been a market that I felt I was weak in. So I, I can't stress that enough to it. Not only does it fill your time and makes everything seem a lot more purposeful, but, um, you know, you would be surprised at how often you grasp at the ideas and say, oh, it's kind of like when I did this in this other market, or it's kind of like when I worked at that and I did this other thing. Um, the great thing about tourism is that the, the amount of transferable skills that we can amass over the course of our, you know, of our career is massive. So um, my biggest advice and the most critical thing to do is never stop learning never stop asking questions and never, I mean, never think that you've got everything covered just because you have like this little, you know, part of your business covered and you're an expert at that. Why not be an expert at something else? Um, yeah, if we now have the time, we have, you know, I mean, it's awful, but we do have the luxury of time in order to invest ourselves in something new. Um, within our industry, there's, dozens of branches that we can, you know, go out on a limb. Sorry for the pun. <laughs> That's okay. We see the limbs swaying in the breeze behind you. So I think it works. If only you could get away with that. Um, for the next section of our panel, I'll be posing some questions and inviting all of the panelists to contribute um, and invite them to contribute to questions that piggyback on those topics uh, to share with everybody else. The first one is, where would you invest your time and resource if you are either a business owner or somebody who is working or looking for work in the industry? You know, the, the investment of time and resource, I think, is really, it's what we have, time. Um, you know, and the resources are always going to be limited. So uh, I pose that to the panel. Any one of you can jump in and go ahead and get started. I see some heads nod nodding along. I don't mind. I don't mind starting off that if that's um, if that's okay. My my take on that for anybody out there that's um, you know that, that's that's finding themselves in a position where they're they're looking for work in the industry, um, and it kind of links with what Rosemarie was saying is, um, I would say, I would say now is just the best ever time to start a business, um, you know, which I know sounds a little bit bizarre, but you know, I'm somebody who's just launched my business in the middle of. Um, you know, let, let's face facts here. This is absolutely the worst time for the travel industry. You know, with other disasters, you could always say things could get worse or not. This is as bad as it gets. This is as bad as it gets. Nobody traveling anywhere globally. It literally doesn't get worse than this. And once you accept that you're at the bottom of the pit, there's literally only one way you can go. You can only go up. So, you know, for me, what an absolutely perfect time to set up your own business. You know, you can start a podcast from home for $5 a month. You can broadcast on YouTube Live or Facebook Live uh, your thoughts and content. Just make sure you find a really good niche that you're passionate about um, and that you've got knowledge about. Um, and 100%, even the smallest of niches have got enough to, to make a business. But you've got the time. You can't fail. You actually can't fail because, you know, everybody's failing. Right now, nobody is coming out of this looking good. So in a time like that, you know, Expedia aren't doing a huge amount of bookings either. So you know, right now, it's the great leveler. Everybody is on exactly the same level. And even your very, very small business where you've just set up your own podcast two weeks ago, do you know what? You're doing as well as anybody. So congratulations. <laughs> and it's a great opportunity to learn as well. I agree. Just I think... I'm back at that. I agree a hundred percent with, with what you just said, Jed. I think it's, um, I have a similar experience in that will the beast launched the end of January and we were, we were flying high for about, I don't know, a month and a half. 
and then everything came to a grinding halt. Um, although we we managed to make do. And my first business that I joined as a co-founder in this industry, I I did that when my first son was six months old. So the challenges of a starting a, a new business, you're always going to have this mountain to climb, no matter what, during the best of times, the worst of times. This is just another hiccup. This is just another, another mountain. Um, so yeah, I agree with everything you said. And I think it is the pandemic has leveled the field and there is there are ideas that are flourishing out of this. And you know, if you have an idea, put pen to paper. The worst thing you, you can possibly do and this is whether you're in business already in this industry, in travel, or you're on the outskirts and you want to get in, the worst possible thing you can do is have an idea in your head and have it stay in your head. I agree. Don't even write a business plan. Just start it. Get a website up, get a web page up. If you need help, there's resources out there for startups. You can call me. I mean, quite honestly, happy to advise new new startups. I've been through it. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is, you know, if you're financially able to, this is a great time to start something. You know, similarly, I can I, see you nodding along. Yeah, no, I would similarly like to piggyback off of what Rosemarie said as well, too. I mean, there's no better time to pick up on learnings and, and Tourism Cares launched its meaningful travel platform during National Travel and Tourism Week in May. Um, it was anticipated to be a member benefit, and, and we chose because of the outbreak of COVID to make it free to all travel professionals and all people within the community. Um, and it has a focus, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a second iteration, call it, of our Good Travel Advisors program, which was initially a primer for uh, frontline agents and travel advisors to learn more about responsible travel and help them to advise their clients. Um, the, the Meaningful Travel Platform takes it further into tenets of sustainability and issues of animal welfare and um, many, many chapters uh, that go much deeper into the topics. And uh, I just promote it because it is free to the industry right now. Uh, it's available through our website, uh, www.tourismcares.org. Um, and to Rosemary's point, I mean, there's there's really no better time. And as Jed and Jared have said, um, I, I think this is the great leveler from that standpoint. And it's a great opportunity if you haven't had a chance, for instance, to uh, a lot of people have been doing virtuals of their destinations. Um, similarly, we have a meaningful travel map uh, within that platform that identifies social enterprises in a number of different um, venues. Um, so this is a great way to see the desti destination beyond the destination. Make um, some really great points there. Uh, I'd like to add, I mean, so exactly like Jed said, like it's year zero, uh, not 2020, but zero as far as I'm concerned when it comes to the fact that the whole travel sector has to restart uh, from scratch. So that means two things, because I mean, I did see a question uh, being asked in the Q&A. Um, if you're actually just starting now in travel and tourism and hospitality and activities, uh, you don't realize how blessed you are because you are actually not carrying a luggage. Uh, you're gonna start with learning from an industry that has to reinvent itself. Um, one thing that's super important, I think, is to, to know to, let go of the ghost of the past. Um, like it, it's gonna be very difficult, especially for companies, small and me medium that had struggled and worked so hard to reach not just profitability, but thriving stages. Uh, uh, and now are back to their beginning um, to move on. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's gonna take a lot of work to a lot of people when it comes to having to reset their mindset uh, to, to understand that, you know, yes, they're, they, they, it's not as if their their experience is, is worthless or their skills uh, are, are not worthy, but they're gonna have to forget you know, the past if they wanna move forward. Uh, that's a big uh, reality that we are all confronting uh, as a result of the crisis. So focus on the baggage you can check at the gate. Um, Catherine, do you have anything you want to contribute to this one? I think I would be doing a, a me too on a lot of the comments. So 
I'll pass and, and just say a lot of a lot of good information shared. Great. Um, Greg, something you and I talked about the other day um, was inclusion and equality within the tourism industry. And uh, you know, I, I'd like to open it up to the panel to talk about or to discuss working in the tourism industry and how we can envision that that inclusion and equality being applied um, and, and how we might see that also with the types of visitors and travelers that we um, can anticipate if we go forward. Well, you know, as I referenced before too, I think, you know, there's, uh, you know, this misconception that sustainability is a trend. Um, similarly, there's a misperception that sustainability focus in, focuses in on the green issues, um, you know, the conservation issues, whereas um, if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which Tourism Cares uses as guideposts, um, two of them are, are very poignant right now, that being uh, one of reduced inequalities and second, uh, one being of good health and well-being. So, you know, you can see that sustainability is an umbrella term um, that really incorporates a, a lot of facets of, uh, of how we can do better within the industry beyond just uh, issues of conservation. And, and clearly when it comes to issues of inclusion, I think that when we look at travelers patterns, um, they are going to be also taking into account the receptivity of that particular destination or perceptions that you might have about that per particular destination relative to issues of inclusion. So I, I think all of these things factor in. So we're, we're at a very uh, going to Jared's first word, we're at a very dynamic time right now. Um, and there's a Great. I think um, just, uh, just, we just, are... just, just on that with regards to the, the, the um, I suppose it's one of the one of the big benefits of, you know, we always talk about travel and tourism and its importance in the world. And it's, I don't know, 10% of global GDP, I think, according to UNWTO and one in 10 jobs. And there's all of these kind of, um, you know, the hard ones, the economic sort of side. But for me, the you know the attraction of travel and tourism was always um, it was that I suppose it's you know it was traditionally called the softer one of the softer benefits, but it was about peace and prosperity. You know, the more I travelled around the world and really got under the skin of different destinations and started to understand the cultures, um, then I started to, you know, really have a have a you know I suppose ignorance was taken away from me, and I think you know to increase global harmony, um, you know the more people travel. The, you know, the more harmony there is because you understand things from, from, you know, from their point of view. Um, I always give an example from, you know, from years ago when I was doing some travel around Europe um, and I, I won't labor on too much on it, but, you know, when I went to, first of all, to France um, and, you know, in a lot of the English tend to sort of, you know, they, they say things which are, you know, I suppose um, a little bit offensive sometimes about the French. Um, and you go to France and you're thinking, God, these people are lovely. These people are wonderful. The food is great. The culture is great. Oh my God, I love the French. And you say this to the French and they say, yeah, but you want to watch out for the Germans. And then you go to Germany and you're like, no way, the Germans are great. This is fantastic. And the Germans are saying, watch out for the Greeks. And then they'll say, watch out for the Turks. And, and the more you travel, you realize actually it's that cliche. We've all got so much more in common uh, than we have you know, that, that divides us. Um, and that becomes only more apparent the more we travel. And that for me is the, is the big part of why travel is just so, so important for everybody. And I think that's one of my big concerns is this, or fears actually as a result of COVID-19, is that travel would ever go back to the preserve of the relatively wealthy. That to me would just be, that would be catastrophic. Um, and I think it would be a great disservice to, to future generations. So that, that's my, my hope is that we don't get back to that, but um, I, I think it's a little bit uncertain at the moment, to be honest. Fantastic. So we've got just a few minutes here and I'd like to go around the panel and uh, if you can share any parting thoughts or advice that you have for, for people who are working in the, in the industry or looking for work in the industry. Uh, Rose, you're at the top of my screen, so I, I'm gonna start with you. Sure. Um, well, I can't put enough emphasis on the value of connection um, and making connections and networking in our industry. Um, it's, a, you know, what we do in hospitality is, is a lot about what we know, but equally important is who we know. 
And we need to cultivate those connections. Take the time now that you have it um, and reach out to people. Um, you know, the other day I reconnected with someone that I worked with almost 30 years ago, and it was bizarre yet wonderful uh, to just have an email chain with this person because they're not on Facebook. Um, and I was like, and that's okay. Um, you know, we talked about old times, but more importantly, we talked about all the people that we have in common, all of the experiences since we've worked together that we have in common and how all of that is just bringing us to this, you know, present state where, you know, we, it is a great leveler, you know, this is a person who no longer works in the industry. Um, and I still do. And it was just insightful, I guess, for her to find out what's been going on. And it was reassuring to me that no matter what happens, you know, I'll always have a job in hospitality. If I, you know, if I figure this out right, uh, half of it is experience, but the other half is who you know. So Great read point. out. Jack. Jared? Yeah, um, so I guess for specifically for new grads or anyone who's gone through a master's program and is now looking to enter the industry, uh, depending, assuming that you're relatively young or at least younger than I am, I'll be 40 in a, a few weeks, so I can say that now. Um, but I think it's, you know, understanding the, the, the industry and the travel industry is super important and understanding that it's not just content creation and pretty photos. And I, and I, I say that because I came from outside travel and I didn't start my career here. And I didn't, I did not admittedly have a very good grasp of what this industry was all about, the big players. And there are some very, very big players at every layer, the supply side, the distribution side. Um, and just understand how the business of travel truly works and understand who these different players are in each sector, in the air sector, in the technology sector. I think also if you're, you know, if you're a recent graduate, this is, I was talking to an intern that I hired um, in my role at Stride Travel three, four years ago. And she's now, she just graduated from her undergrad and she's looking to get back into marketing. And she's like, you know, what should I do? And I said, look, you're, you're, you are, you have, you have very few commitments. Now is a, the best time to take a risk. If you're going to, to, to take that risk and let's admit it, getting into travel right now, there's a degree of risk there. Now is the time to do that. Um, and the last point is that if you're already in the business and you're, you're thinking about where to go from here, I would just say, make sure you have an insurance plan. And I think the best insurance plan I, in my own experience um, has been a transferable skill, meaning you know, understand finance, understand accounting, understand marketing, understand something that if you need to fall back on it and pivot and change industries on a dime, at least you have that knowledge and that base to go out and find a new job, maybe temporarily, while things sort of settle down within travel. Great. Uh, Greg, uh, quickly, your takeaway or advice? Sure. I mean, clearly, uh, follow your heart and your passion um, and start constructing your story. Um, my story, uh, you know, started with uh, an event uh, in 2003 where. 300 industry professionals came to Ellis Island uh, for a volunteer cleanup and it was Tourism Care's first event. And so that uh, is chapter one of, of my story. And if, if I hadn't set foot there, I may not be sitting here right now. So um, follow your heart and passion and construct the story because uh, you know someday you'll be telling that story and it all seem like it all makes sense and was all meant to be. Um, and I, you know, I'm proof positive there. Right, Jed. Just, I suppose, it echoes really what I what what I said before is um, there's there's never been a better time in my mind if you've got an idea or a nugget of an idea um, uh, for a niche or whatever in the travel industry. Literally, the best time to follow through on that idea and set up on your own is right now because we're at rock bottom. It's only going to get better, and it's a great golden opportunity. I think. Jonathan, quickly. Um, for business owners, I'll tell you to, uh, within the travel sector, uh, start implementing, if you haven't done so, risk management practices to shelter and, and shield your employees and your companies uh, from the cyclical nature of 
catastrophes and disasters that are happening in our industry. Um, and for employees and people who are still working, I'm going to say, don't forget uh, those who were not as fortunate as you, uh, because it's going to take a lot of time before all those people who are displaced or have not uh, do not have an income or a job right now for them to uh, get back on their feet. And it's going to be very easy once we're out of confinements or back on the path to recovery uh, to forget about them. Uh, so please keep them in mind, uh, you know, not just the occasional new job opening, but it's a checkup call, uh, you know, uh, exactly as Rosemary was saying, uh, we're, we're, our connections make such a difference. Uh, it's now better than never before that you can actually prove to them that you're not just connected to them because of a vested interest. Uh, right. So check on your friends uh, and your industry and your uh, tourism family. And then Catherine, we'll be wrapping up. Yep, for someone looking for work in the industry, I wanna stress patience. Uh, look at the new uh, skill sets and knowledge base that's needed, sustainability best practices, uh, someone in tune with health and safety standards, technological advances like online booking, virtual experiences, as well as we were talking about earlier, addressing diversity, equality, and inclusion. You know, hone your skills as a scenario planner. Adaptability has a whole new meaning. Because uh, remember, we're uh, going to be doing a lot of pivoting. And with that, I would like to thank each and every one of our panelists for joining. Uh, Jan, I see that you joined in with us. Would, do you have something you'd like to contribute? Yeah, thank you. Um, First of all, thank you for a great conversation. Very interesting. Um, I would like to close officially our bus expo, if I may take a few minutes of your time. My name is Jan Larsen from Bus Travel. Um, it's five o'clock somewhere in Europe. So it's time to close and time to turn off the engines. We have still more, one more live event, but that will be a bit too late for Europe. So I will take this opportunity to say, to close now. Um, our meeting place will also be open for a couple of days still, but we close now. This was our first bus travel expo. I think we had a good run. Now it's time for us to evaluate what we did good and what we need to improve in the future. Your comments, your remarks, critical, positive, will be much appreciated. We plan for the future to make such uh, expos on a regular basis we will make pure bus travel expos and we plan to team up with organizations who have good ideas, good concepts, and then we make such expos. They don't need to be five days, but shorter together. The idea of, idea of bus travel is to create a place where travel professionals meet, socialize and do business. Rose had some comments about how important connecting is we are here to facilitate such connection process. I want to thank the uh, exhibitors who took uh, part in our expo. Thank you to the speakers. And um, I think we had a lot of great speakers. I think we had a lot of good content. And I also need to thank all the people who helped us put this together. We have had a lot of fantastic people who reached out and uh, who were very helpful. I also need to thank our bus team. They will need to have a couple of hours sleep now. They've been working very hard during the last couple of days. And I need to address a special thank you to Katja. Katja, you haven't seen her on, on stage here, but she is the woman behind all this. She is the brains. She is the lifeblood of bus travel. Uh, she will need to sleep a lot. One final remark. Um, some of you, perhaps many of you, have noticed that I am not from this industry. I was trained somewhere else, and um, that is perhaps, perhaps noted by some of you. Preparing this event has been a personal, very um, satisfying experience. I have very seldom met so many helpful people, people who are dedicated to doing something, to changing something, and people who are not only working for their own pockets. It has really been a great experience. Thank you so much. 
and hereby I officially close the uh, live event part. As I said, we are still open for a couple of days for the meeting room. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Everyone.